Welcome to week four of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, where I like to go over my favorite standard decks in the meta. And I usually like to start things off with some budget options if I have found some. And so this week we've got a budget sunshot god combo by Saffron Olive. The only mythic that is required is the red god, uh, Oger Oxenil Deepest Might. And the reason for this is if a red source deals dam non-combat damage less than the red god's power, then it deals that damage instead. So um, all of your ping one damage becomes four. And you combine this with Sunshot Militia, which allows you to tap two untapped artifacts and or creatures to deal one damage to your opponent. And you can uh, the rest of it is all just either pingers or things that are good at producing um, artifacts that you can tap with the Sunshot Militia. And so we've got like Collector's Vault, which creates treasure tokens as well as cycles to help you find your combo and your god. Uh, we've got Lightning Strike for some direct damage. Uh, we've got the Charming Scoundrel, which can create a treasure token uh, for Sunshot Militia. Uh, if you have an empty hand, you can discard nothing and then draw a card. Uh, we've got the Voltaren Epicure, which pings for one damage, pings for four if you have the god in play, but also gives you a blood token, which helps you find your, your combo. Play with fire for some more direct damage as well, so you can burn them down with the lightning, with the lightning strike, and the play with fire before you get your god out. But you, you know, mostly this is going to be used for clearing your opponent's stuff, doing some early interaction while you stall. Because once you hit this, you 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 can deal the twenty damage in one go. Uh, we've got Kumano, which pings for one, also pings for four if you have the god in play. Gives a, a creature plus one plus one, and then becomes a two two haster. We get in the festivities, which deals one damage to each opponent and each creature, which uh, then becomes four if you've got <laughs> the god in play. Uh, Geological Appraiser, which we've uh, is a new card from the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Um, when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, discover three. So this helps you find your uh, cheaper pieces of the combo, find your Sunshot Militias, as well as just being two rectangles in one. Um, helps you develop the board and go wide so you have more things to tap with the Militia. Witchstalker's Frenzy for some nice cheap interaction, and then we've got the Virtue of Courage. Oh, sorry, there is another mythic, my bad. There's two copies of Virtue of Courage, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's not the most inexpensive. There are budget lists out there that are all strictly commons and uncommons, but only, you know, six mythics is relatively cheap, especially um, in, you know, real, in, in paper. Uh, this deck is less than 100 bucks, which is uh, is pretty nice. And that Virtue of Courage deals two damage to any target on the adventure side, but then on the enchantment side, whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, you may exile that many cards from the top of your library, and you may play those cards this turn. So it, this gives you a little bit of late game dig, and I do think you could probably get away with not running the Virtue of Courage if you want to just... This is the important piece, right? But this gives you some uh, you know additional dig. You could maybe replace this with like Reckless Impulse, and I think it would still be okay. The fact that it is dig as well as burn, though, I mean, like, you're going to want the mythic if you have it. And then uh, 13 lands, four copies of Mishra's Foundry in case we are up against some control decks. And then this is a best of three deck, so we've got two additional copies of In the Festivities if you need to uh, destroy all of the 1-1 token decks like Boros Humans, etc. Uh, Lithomanic Barrage for a little bit of hatred against white or blue. Furnace Punisher um, can be really nice if they're playing like Domain and have no basic lands. You, you side these in and it just deals a bunch of damage. And it will deal four damage if you have the God in play. Uh, we've got Lith yeah, more copies of Lithmana Barrage. Uh, Twisted Fealty, which is uh, a Threaten for three that also creates a Wicked Roll token. And the token is a um, enchantment aura that you can attach to something to give plus one plus one. And then when it dies, it deals one di uh, loses one life. And then we've got the uh, one one last copy of Witchstalker's Frenzy. All right, and then after the budget de decks, I'd like to cover best of three. And we have several best of three lists that come from people who hit Mythic. So this one is Simic Cookies by Blizza MTG. And uh, I've also heard Ash Lizzle get credited for this as far as like who actually created the deck. I don't know. <laughs> the person who submitted it and hit Mythic was uh, Blizza MTG, so I'm going to go with that. Um, but, you know, Ash is also amazing and, and created a deck that's very similar to this, if not exactly the same. 
Um, but this one is basically centered around artifact payoffs. So you have uh, Teething Wormlet, which is a 1-1 one -one that has Death Touch as long as you control three or more artifacts. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, you gain one life. And then if this is the first time it's happened, you get a, a plus one, plus one counter on Teething Wormlet. So with as many artifacts that enter the battlefield in this deck, you should be able to get a plus one, plus one counter on Teething Wormlet every single turn. And um, we've also got the Zoetic Glyph, which was from the Lost Caverns. And this card's amazing as long as you have artifact synergies. Um, you create an art, your artifact turns into a 5 4 that when it dies, it discovers three. And this has been a problematic card in Limited, and I'm happy to see it in Constructed. And then uh, we've also got Tough Cookie, which uh, allows you to animate your non creature artifacts into 4 4 artifact creatures for two and a green. And then you can also sacrifice it. So all of these cookies is why it's called Simic Cookie. And they, uh, if you're getting beat down, they can also sacrifice themselves for life. And then uh, as far as the enablers go, we've got Ginger Brute, which is just a cheap artifact. We've got, uh, excuse me, we've got Surge Engine, um, if I can find it on my with my brain here. Yeah, uh, which is a nice cheap artifact that can turn into a late game threat. And then we've got uh, Spyglass Siren, which creates a map token when it enters the battlefield, giving you more, more artifact fodder. And then we've got um, Sentinel of the Nameless City. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, you create a map token. And then to finish it off, we've got a little bit of interaction with Disruption Protocol, which is a counterspell for two blue. If, uh, as an additional cost to cast the spell, tap an untapped artifact you control or pay one. So it's a cancel, but because you have so many artifacts, this usually just plays as a straight up counter spell for two blue. And um, then we've got Subterranean Schooner, which has been in a lot of lists and uh, being able to, you know, it's it's a cheap, it's a cheap vehicle for two. You get a three, four and with crew cost one, very low. You can crew it with your ginger brutes. And then whenever it does that, uh, it, it triggers an explore. So it really helps you cycle through your deck and find the cards that you need. And then it is a best of three, so we've got three copies of Haywire Might. If you find yourself up against um, an artifact or an enchantment deck, you can bring these in. Um, uh, all, you know, for like Ginger Brutes, for example. Uh, we've got Tishana's Tidebinder, which uh, has been a really impressive card. If you have some annoying triggered abilities, like if you're up against uh, Shieldred, you can bring this in. You can take out Adeline and make it so that it, it becomes just a 0-4 do-nothing against Mono White. Um, been been very impressed with this card. Uh, Ren and Realm Breaker, which gives you a little bit more of a, a late game strategy where you um, you can use this to <clears throat> ramp, but um, find, finding your combos with the Agatha's Soul Cauldron is, is where the, the, the Ren and Realm Breaker can, can do some interesting things in this deck because Agatha's Soul Cauldron allows you to give these abilities like Ginger Brutes can't be blocked except by creatures with haste. So if that's working really well for you, you can kind of bring that combo in to make the Soul Cauldron better. So you'd bring in your third copy as well. We've got Spell Pierce, which is counter target non-creature spell unless this controller pays two. And this is good if you're fighting mostly non-creature spells like Azorius Control. We've got Witness Protection if you need some more, um, you know, specific interaction and removal. If they're, if they're playing a problematic threat that your deck is not doing well against, Simic doesn't have a whole lot of options, and Witness Protection is probably your best cheap interaction. And then we've got Royal Treatment. Um, on the flip side, if they've got a lot of interaction and are destroying your, um, you know, destroying your pieces uh, that you want to keep alive, then you can bring in the Royal Treatment. And what's nice about this one too is that it does create a Royal creature role, uh, a Royal role, um, which gives you some more tokens to to, to work with. The second best of three mythic list that I'd like to cover this week is Is It Pirates by Simone Uribe. Probably massacring your name, I apologize. And uh, this one is just leaning heavily into the pirate and artifact synergies that we got in Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And so we've got like Goblin Tomb Raider, which is a 2-2 haste as long as you control an artifact. Uh, we've got the Captain Storm Cosmium Raider, which is a 2-2 that whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target pirate you control. Uh, we've got the Spyglass Siren, again, uh, just a 1-1 flyer that creates a map token, has been very impressive in Limited and, uh, and in Constructed. 
And then we've got a staunch crewmate, which uh, is a two one that allows you to look for the look at the top four cards of your library and reveal an artifact or a pirate and then put them into your hand. So it's excellent dig helps you from running out of uh, fuel. We've got uh, breaches, which is amazing if you have a whole bunch of pirates, because whenever a pirate you control attacks, you choose one of the three and you can if you're attacking with three pirates, you can choose all three. Uh, you create a treasure token or target creature can't block this turn or you exile the top card of your library and you may play it. So breaches has been a top performing rare in limited. And uh, I'm curious to see how this deck does in constructed. But, you know, if they hit the guy hit mythic, <laughs> if the person hit mythic, then it's got to be pretty decent. Um, so we've got the uh, Kite Sail Larcenist, which is a pirate with flying in Ward 1 as a for 3, and also removes your opponent's stuff or helps you ramp. So you can change one of your map tokens. Um, you, you choose a tar artifact or creature for both players, and then they turn into treasure tokens for as long as Larcenist is on the battlefield. So you can choose one of your map tokens and turn it into a treasure if you want to ramp to something more expensive the following turn, and you can just remove your opponent's like biggest threat. And then uh, we've also got Roaming Throne, which uh, is great for the tribal theme of the pirate deck going on here. It makes all of your uh, pirates trigger an additional time when they enter the battlefield. And so you get additional plus one plus ones or, you know, additional artifacts. And uh, it's pretty good. And then we've got a uh, Witch Stalker's Frenzy for removing problematic threats. And... Um, the oh yeah uh spell pierce for a little bit of like preventing our stuff from getting targeted protecting captain storm from getting eliminated by early interaction and then uh, it is a best of three list so we've got voltage surge which uh, if you need more interaction you can take advantage of the fact of having a lot of cheap uh, map tokens to be able to you know deal four damage negate if once if you're up against azorius control or something like that that has a lot of non-creature spells you can bring in the negates uh, we've got the Jaya Firing Negotiator, which helps kind of go uh, if you need a little bit more extin extension to get around Wraths, right? So like Wraths won't target Planeswalkers. So if you're dealing with, again, again with control, you can bring in Jaya as a way to um, help you kind of win out in the long run. Lithomanic Barrage, if you're up against white or blue, Azorius Soldiers, Mono White, etc. Disdainful Stroke or... Um, this one's part disdainful stroke is particularly nice for the um, domain matchup, but that was before the Cavern of Souls. The more expensive your opponent's spells are, the more good targets like hitting an Atraxa with disdainful stroke. If they don't have the Cavern of Souls to make it uh, uncounterable, it's kind of uh, what I would be thinking about with these. And then we've got a braid, which is just some artifact hate if you're if you're up against the Simic artifacts, for example. And here we've got the uh, third. Mythic best of three list, uh, Rakdos Midrange by Mike Kubias, uh, Kubilas. And Rakdos was once the top performer in the meta. Now, it's been a while since it's, they, it was the, the like number one deck. Um, but you see a lot of the, you see a lot of familiar faces in this list, right? So you, you've got Tenacious Underdog, four copies there. You've got the, uh, Blood Tithe Harvester. You've got the Graveyard Trespasser. Uh, you've got Shieldred, the Apocalypse, and you've got Cut Down. You've got Go for the Throat. So um, what? And then and Gix's command. So really, <laughs> a lot of the old familiar cards. And then uh, what, where they decided to take it, which I think was kind of interesting, um, bringing in the Orobrask's Forge to increase the speed or the pressure of the deck. And this has been a, a very impressive card as long as they don't have artifact hate. And then Obnix Silas, the adversary, is also um, good at increasing the clock and the pressure on your opponent. And um, so the goal is to make the deck faster. And then we've got, you know, like Molten Collapse we got in Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And it, I think this seems like pretty good removal for Rakdos. Destroy card creature or planeswalker. And if you descended, uh, which is if a permanent card went into your graveyard from anywhere, if you discarded, whatever. Um, then you can also destroy target non-creature non-land permanent with mana value one or less, which, you know, you like sniping map tokens or whatever. Uh, Shieldred's Edict is also just classic removal. And then we've got Archfiend of the Dross, which uh, I've seen this in a, some lists like here and there. Uh, this one can backfire or it can be a little bit problematic. Like if, if this gets hit by um, like a enchantment removal that keeps it on the board you can end up losing from it but it is a lot of pressure as long as you're able to 
win the game quickly enough that it doesn't make you lose, right? <laughs> and uh, it is a best of three list. So we've got Duress for against the control decks. We've got Lilian of the Veil um, for also against the control decks. Being able to discard their hand is one of the best ways to answer control is just take away their card advantage, get them hellbent. Um, we've got the Urborg Scavengers, which... Um, allows you to exile a card from a graveyard and put a 1-1 counter on it. And then it has flying, as long as the card exile has flying, etc. So this one is a really good counter to like the Atraxa, uh, Atraxa reanimator decks, where if you can remove their Atraxa from the graveyard, then they have nothing to reanimate. And not only that, but then Urberg Scavenger gets all of the abilities that Atraxa had, right? So it gets flying, lifelink, death touch, etc. So, you know, this is some Atraxa hate. We've got the Lithomanic Barrage for Hate Against White and Blue. Extract the Truth, which um, reveal their hand. You may choose a creature, enchantment, or planeswalker. That player discards that card. Or target opponent sacrifices an enchantment. So this one's kind of cool because uh, we, we've seen a lot of enchantment hate, right? And usually or a lot of enchantments. So whether or not it's Wedding Announcement or if it's Virtue of Loyalty, like I think this works really well with the mid-range decks. And um, you can also just use it if they don't have the enchantment. It's not a total whiff. You can try to remove something like a planeswalker or a creature from your opponent's hand. And then we've got the uh, Brotherhood's End, which is a classic wrath spell. Deals three damage to each creature and each planeswalker. So this is really good if you're up against one of the go wide strategies. And for the, uh, the next segment, what I like to do is look at tournaments specifically. And my favorite one is the standard challenge on Magic the Gathering Online or Moto. And uh, last week on December 2nd, uh, first place was Esper Midrange by Ariane. And if we compare this to the Esper Midrange list that we saw in week three, and we saw two versions, so I'm going to go off of the first version. But uh, what we see here is we get an increase, uh, one more copy of Dinic, Highest Apprentice, uh, one, more, uh, one copy of Lauren of the Third Path, or some uh, enchantment and artifact hate, really good against the Mirror Match. Um, we see uh, two copies of the Tishana's Tidebinder in the main. And uh, like I said, I really like this card. I think there are some really creative hits that you can target with this and just make cards useless. So, you know, it's good against like Shieldred, Adeline, um, anything with the triggered ability. So like you can even hit it on Rafine and uh, pay, you have to pay the board, but still making Rafine into uh, just a 1-4 is fantastic. So I think this has a lot of applications, and I'm happy to see this in the main. Uh, we, we decided to take out the, or Arion decided to take out the three copies of Shieldred the Apocalypse and um, not run them in the main. We've got uh, one more copy of Destroy Evil to just give us some more enchantment hate. Uh, one more copy of Make Disappear, which uh, I thought we were going to see less Make Disappears, but... Um, it's still good for removing interaction, right? So like Cavern of Souls just protects creatures and in best of three you see lots of interaction and not as many tribal decks that are just creatures. So I think, you know, it makes sense to take this up to three here. And we've just, uh, Arion's decided to get rid of two copies of Get Lost. And uh, I, I think that, you know, like, it, you know, removing something to give them two map tokens, if, if they get the value out of the map tokens, it's bad, right? So I think that like, um, if the game's going longer and best of three tends to be longer than best of one, then the get lost perform less, w less well. And then, uh, this one is also running one less cave of Coleos and, uh, just the, the pain land and black white and running one more edition of the Plaza of Heroes. And then for the best of three sideboard, we've got Negate, a second copy of Lauren of the Third Path, a third copy of Tidebinder, two wandering emperors, uh, Shieldred the Apocalypse, Duress, Destroy Evil, Disdainful Stroke, and two copies of Gix's Command as its, its Wrath choice. And second place on the second, and first place on the third, um, was a mono-red aggro list by DeLeon91. And uh, when they when they placed uh, first on the third, they made one change, which was to add one Strangle and uh, go down one mountain. Uh, and then also Marion placed third place on the second, and they also decided to go down one mountain and up one Charming Scoundrel. So very similar lists. Um, however, I haven't covered mono-red aggro in best of three specifically, 
for quite some time. But I, I do think it kind of makes sense. You, you started to see a shift in people playing less, uh, playing decks that were worse against aggro, right? Like a lot of them were like, okay, well, there's not a lot of pressure happening. So I'm going to, you know, for example, like run more up the beanstalks and take out some of the go for the throats and the early interaction. So I think there was enough of a shift in the meta that like uh, the, the aggro strategies are like, ah, I can finally get in. And so we, we actually saw a fair amount of mono red in the last week's uh, standard challenge, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but if we compare this to best of one, um, I do think there's it's it's useful to compare to best of one at some times because it just it kind of helps you understand what the difference is between the two formats, between best of one and best of three, and where the you know the top performing players are deciding to t what what they're deciding to take out and why. And so you can see that we've got two less copies of uh, Monastery Swift Spear and one more copy of the Charming Scoundrel, if we compare this to the list that I covered in week two. And we've got one less copy of Godric Cloaked Reveler, and no copies of Monstrous Rage. And um, I think that makes a lot of sense because in best of one, you're looking to just go over your opponent if they do decide to block you. And so you have a lot of matchups where you're playing up against other mono red or mono white, and um, less of those mid-range and uh, control strategies. And so it's really good for punishing the block, right? Whereas in best of three, you run the Witch Stalker's Frenzy because you're more likely to come up against things that um, block your early pressure. And so you're more likely to want to do the removal. And so we've got four, four copies of Witch Stalker's Frenzy and um, deciding to up from 22 lands to 24. We don't have the hand smoother in best of three, so you can't get away with as low of a land count. And then the uh, best of three sideboard has in the festivities for if you're coming up against like Boros Furnace Punisher, if you're coming up against Domain or uh, even some of the Esper midrange, like some of the decks just have a very few, um, a number of basic lands. So you can bring these in to punish your opponent for playing a lot of the uh, non basic lands with the Manic Barrage. If you're up against Mono White or uh, Azorius, um, White and Blue Hate. And then we've got Urbrask's Forge. Um, which can be really good if your opponent is lacking the destroy artifact. This eventually gives you some inevitability to just overtaking the game. And if we compare the sideboards to Marion's was very similar. They decided to run one additional uh, one copy of Koth Fire of Resistance and uh, took out one in the festivities. Second place was a Bant control list by Nameless Thing, and if we compare this, I think it's most it's it's closest to Azorius control, but it has similarities to what we've been seeing in Domain as well. So it's kind of a hybrid between the two, but I think it's closest is uh, for me is to compare it to the Azorius control that I listed in week one, and uh, we see that we get one copy of Nissa Ascended Animist, which we've seen starting to show up in some of the Domain lists as well. Uh, we've got the two copies of the Hornblock Whale, which is both interaction as well as a late game threat. Um, minus four copies of the Chromeho Seed Shark, which um, works really well with the Leyline Bindings. And so that one <clears throat> is in the sideboard instead of in the main. Um, we've got the uh, down the Confounding Riddles, down the Make Disappears, uh, down the Memory Deluge, which I thought was very interesting. And... Um, <clears throat> down the out of airs so the 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 uh counter spell that they decided to run was syncopate where you tap x and and counter target spell unless its controller pays x and then if it was countered this way exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard so that that can be relevant that it gets rid of it entirely and then we've got um two copies of the march of otherworldly light which is some more specific removal and interaction lay down arms so instead of countering we're leaning more towards removal which makes sense if we've got to work around the cavern of souls right and uh silver scrutiny for some card draw i was very curious to see the silver scrutiny in here over the memory deluge um but part of the reason why the uh we don't really we don't really need it is up the beanstalk so up the beanstalk is is leaning it more heavily into the green uh, which we saw actually some green being played already for increasing domain for the uh, leyline bindings, um, but the, you know we, we've got like like uh, Bosasia who endures. We've got more green sources in this list, making it fully banned. And up the beanstalk is a way to just never run out of cards. Uh, we've got two additional copies of Sunfall, which I like to see. the The original list in week one was only running two, which I thought was a little bit on the short side. And then uh, we've got one copy of the Celestis for some additional card draw and filtering. 
and down to 26 lands from 28. Uh, you know, and it mostly just some tweaks here and there from um, to make you know to reflect the increased costs of having more green. And then the best of three sideboard, we've got Elspeth Smite, uh, the Chromo Seed Shark, which uh, you can bring in to combine with your Leyline Bindings if you need more of a mid-range threat. If you're having difficulty closing out the game with just your Wandering Emperor uh, and your Nissa and your Mirix, right? Like this, this is a very, it's got very few threats. So if you end up like against the end and they remove the Wandering Emperor, then you might want to bring in some additional stuff. Obstinate Balith is really good against Liliana. If they're making you discard, then you get a free 4 4 and you gain 4 life. So it's a really good way to punish the Liliana. Uh, we've got Holebreaker Horror, which again, if you need an additional win condition, um, Holebreaker Horror can just win you the game once you get there. And so you can bring that in. Uh, another copy of Elspeth Smite for early interaction, Disdainful Stroke, and uh, Knockout Blow if you if you are against Mono Red. Temporary Lockdown, which is yeah, absolutely devastating to the early decks, right? Both Mono Red and Mono White can kind of really struggle against this card. Although the Get Lost in uh, Mono White does make this a little bit weaker. And then we've got the Cosmic Rebirth, which um, choose target permanent in your graveyard. If it has mana value three or less, you may put it onto the battlefield. If you don't put it on the battlefield, put it into your hand, you gain three life. And we've got uh, the third list here. I don't usually go this hard in, you know, into it, but I thought there was some really cool stuff going on in best of three this week. So, uh, you know, pardon me for having a whole bunch of best of three lists. Um, but this one was uh, third place and Azorius Artifacts. And I, I, this one was new. I, I, I was excited by what they were doing here, but this is um, Azorius Artifacts by Bernastoris. And it's basically a control deck that looks to take early interaction or prevent um, disrupt your opponent's early plays through cards like Market Gnome, uh, the Spring Loaded Saw Blades, the uh, Braided Nets, which allows you to um, tap in a tap a creature for three turns and then turns into really good late game card draw in a deck that has enough artifacts to fuel it. Um, and then we've got some ramps. So we've got like one copy of the Iron Crag. Uh, Thran's Spider, which uh, ramps you and your opponent, but you should have more ability to actually use what's coming from the Thran Spider, uh, the Power Stones. And then um, we've also got the uh, Fabrication Foundry, which uh, was a card that was bugged in the first little bit and banned and limited uh, because it was not performing what, the way that it was supposed to. Um, but we can use this to also ramp into a big payoff and the the payoffs in the deck are like the wrath the unstable glyph bridge which has been amazing and limited and i was curious to see if it was going to get more constructed play but it's a wrath that turns later into a creature that then prohibits your opponent's plays because they can either attack you or play a spell as long as wander glyph doesn't get destroyed and then we've got the uh, thousand moon smithy which um is an, a legendary artifact that spawns these gnomes that are uh, star star creatures equal to the number of artifacts under creatures you control and then it flips into a land that then continues to create more and more of these gnomes so this is just a good way to out, out overpower your opponent and then we've got the might stone and weak stone which is uh, you know it, you can use it to draw cards you can use it to give something minus five minus five but um and then also gives you additional ramp and uh, it's a best of three list so we've got uh, negates once again, for against those non-creature spells, a call pakal for additional dig. Um, this one, and, and same with Urza, Lord Protector. Kind of think about like what your opponent's interaction is looking like, and if you need to go for outvaluing your opponent, or if you need to avoid, you know, uh, getting getting beat up by your opponent's single point removal. Uh, Glass Casket for some good interaction if you're up against the cheaper decks. Disdainful Stroke if you're up against the more expensive decks. And then Knockout Blow if you're against Mono Red. And then every week I also like to go in and look at the top performing decks on Best of One. And uh, the way that I like to do that is to use Untapped and to look specifically at the decks that have at least a thousand matches. And so it, it isn't the fastest rotating list. And um, Mono, you know, Best of One doesn't tend to have as much of a rock, paper, scissors mechanic as uh, best of three does, because usually just trying to jam as many games as possible until you get up to mythic or diamond and then switch over to best of three if you're really interested in getting to the high ranks of mythic. And uh, so number one, the top performing list is still the mono white humans list that I covered in week two. 
Um, number two is a mono red aggro list. And if we compare this to week two, we see very few changes. The, the only change are minus one Charming Scoundrel or plus one Felden for a total of four copies of Felden and uh, one less Mountain, but keeping the same uh, land count because we're increasing the Sokenzong Crucible of Defiance to two. And this has nice combination, you know, uh, nice synergies with Godric Cloaked Reveler. And the last deck that I'll cover this week is uh, Gruel Aggro. Oh, I should mention first. Uh, number three is Slesny Enchantments, which uh, was the same list that... If we compare it to the week two list and the, the list that I ran, the 50 matches of standard showcase, uh, the only difference is, is minus four Brushland for plus two planes and plus two forests. I, mean, I mentioned that change last week, and I'll just mention it again. Uh, number four was a domain ramp list that I covered in week three. That is uh, specifically geared towards surviving best of one. So you're seeing depopulate as well as sunfall that is performing uh, at number four. And then number five was gruel aggro. And this one, if we compare this to the list that I called gruel combat tricks, which was a mythic list at the beginning of Lost Caverns of Ixalan, this doesn't have any cards from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. So this is just primarily like... Um, but it, it has been performing relatively well in the best of one meta. And I think it kind of looks like a fun deck to try out, right? So I'm going to put this one on the poll this week. Um, so but if we compare it to week one, the only change is that uh, we're not running four copies of Thran Portal and instead have decided to uh, add three copies of Rock Fail, uh, add three copies of Rockfall Veil vale to a total of four. Uh, so there's only 19 lands in this list, so it's ultra low, and you're really just trying to hit into your combat tricks so that you can win through Cacophony Scamp, hitting for a ton of damage, uh, Picnic Ruiner, getting Double Strike. It, it, you know, it's, it's it's one of those things that, like, you try to hit up a, a critical mass of damage and, and end your opponent's dreams in one turn. So <laughs> I, I definitely want to check it out. Um that that's it for this week uh remember to hit like and subscribe if you like this sort of uh thing i do it every single week and uh, every single sunday will be kind of the meta review every saturday will be the 50 showcases of a standard deck and then uh throughout the week is usually more limited stuff and um so if that's uh, you know if that's what you're interested in uh welcome to my community and uh uh, yeah, I wish you luck on your your matches and and uh, future magic the game magic games and maybe I'll see you on the ladder. <laughs>